Hi there, welcome for a new video now. This video is all about applying the E1 some parts of the syllabus which we have picked up in the pre-scene analysis to our company Tracks Europe. I'm going to keep it short, I'm going to keep it limited, but I'm going to make it very, very specific. I'm going to make it very, very, uh, I'll say, directed to the Tracks Europe situation. So E1 is very theory heavy, has a lot of theory, you know, it has also a lot of models. Students often ask us, are we supposed to remember all of that? My straightforward suggestion is absolutely not. Think, you know, at work, when somebody asks you, just for example, how can you, uh, you know, how can you motivate your team? Will you be like, this person gave this model and let's follow this? No, right? You'll say from your studies and from your experience, you'll come up with simple business-related acumen, simple business-related pointers, and then put it forward. You have to do the same in the case study exam. The words or the points that you have learned from E1 can be used, but it cannot be copy-pasted. You have to present it in your own explanations. You have to present it in your own understanding. You have to present it in your own way. And that is why application is very, very, very important. Students often focus on learning, but not on application. I don't want that. I want you to create your own simple explanations. I want you to create your own simple suggestions. I want you to create your own simple direction, your own words, no theories. I don't want anything to be, uh, you know, learnt and mugged up. I don't want any of that. I want simple your own theory. I want simple your own explanations to prevail. And I want your own words. That should be the theme throughout the learning process. First topic we are considering is type of organizations. Now I'll try to cover all, uh, you know, chapters of E1 from 1 to 12 with the important aspects as well. But I'll cover the topics which we have spoken about in the pre-scene because they are prominently coming up. So firstly, types of organizations in our pre-scene, it is very clear that we have a functional structure divided by functions. So over here, the thought should be, what are the different other structures which are available? The first structure is the entrepreneurial structure. It's for smaller companies where one person leads the organization at the top and all the employees are under that one person. This is naturally not possible for our company because it's a very large company, lots of uh, you know products and, lot, and uh, the scale is huge. So... We come to the second one, which is a functional structure, which our company currently has. You know, there's a board of directors at the top and then under each board of director, there are different departments, the marketing department and the production department and the finance department and this department, that department. Everything is very clearly put over uh, under departments and that is why we have a functional structure. The functional structure has some advantages, which we know. First being economies of scale, standardization, because everything related to marketing happening under the marketing department. They are, people become specialists because you're only focusing on marketing, for example. And they have good career opportunities. From a marketing lower level officer, you can become a marketing head as well because you've developed that experience. The disadvantages are empire building. People start to get more comfortable don't want to adapt, you know, th that is one thing that really happens in many organizations because they're doing the same thing. You know, there's no real challenge and they don't want to change then because they've been doing the same thing for a long time. Also, it can cause conflict between functions. If you have a fixed budget for finance, fixed budget for production department, then finance can argue, why is production department getting a higher budget? Some of it might be justifiable because they are actually producing products, but 
there can still be that conflict there can still be that unsatisfactory situation there can still be that uh, i'll just say there can still be that un th that conflict that arises between these two departments and any department and any function this can occur so we have a functional structure advantages have been stated disadvantages have been stated as well next third type of structure is the divisional structure now divisional structure is based on geography as well as products your different products can be different divisions and your different geographical locations can also be different divisions now this is something that we also see in our pre scene now in the operational case study exam they don't give you the exact organizational structure they'll give you departmental structure so for sales there is a divisional structure which i'll show you for production and for finance it's a very clear functional structure that we discussed so remember divisional structure is where each geographical location in our case is a separate division last but not the least there is a matrix structure where there is dual reporting reporting twice you'll see over here the production department manager or oh, everything remains the same just that the reporting becomes twice so the production manager reports to production department sales department finance department r&d and then eventually this goes to the senior management you're seeing how there is dual reporting production manager b also reports to the production department production manager c also reports to the production department production department head then reports it ahead so to one person more than one person is reporting and then that is taken upwards now there is no evidence of a matrix structure for our company so we will not pay heed to that but let's understand our structures you'll see for sales they have told you sales and distribution director is at the top under it the till end sales manager then the southern europe sales manager northern europe sales manager which means the sales have been divided by division by geographical division so it's a functional structure overall but under sales there is geographical division as well so we can see each geographical area is broken down into department over here for till end george uh, gregor newman is given the responsibility for southern europe trina grig and for northern europe thomas bilf so all three of these directors report to their functional heads which is rena blois so you can see there is a functional structure overall but in the sales and distribution department they have a geographical based divisional structure so it's important for us to understand the benefits and the drawbacks of breaking down into a geographical based divisional structure if you look at finance it's very straightforward functional finance director at the top then the manager then the finance team you look at production also you know very straight forward for example if you look at production we have jack newman at the top then we have the procurement senior manager procurement warehouse and production under production we have the different production managers you know engine assembly chassis assembly body panel production main assembly testing manager all of these are reporting to our production senior manager so the hierarchical uh, structure is again visible hierarchical functional structure is again visible so for finance and production a very straightforward functional structure is given but for sales like you see they have broken it down in terms of geography so till end southern europe northern europe for sales finance and production is functional structure overall structure of the organization also seems to be functional but there is no uh, diagram given for the same so for your benefit 
you can know functional structure advantages disadvantages uh, your geographical based divisional structure advantages disadvantages that will help you next topic we discuss is outsourcing very very common and a very common exam question as well so what is outsourcing you may ask me now in our pre scene they have told us that the service provided after the tractor is sold is already outsourced we don't do that it's been done by the dealership it's been done by the people who sell the final tractor to the customer we don't handle that same way a scenario can come up where they say that for example hr is now being outsourced or they can say that the engine assembly or part, maybe you know one part of the engine assembly is being outsourced you receive directly uh, that part which directly goes into production that can be a situation right engine assembly right now the entire thing is done by you where from scratch all the parts components and sub assemblies are brought in what if they tell you that you know uh, for example engine assembly needs 10 parts which you assemble two of the parts are now already assembled and come to you from the supplier the other eight parts you have to assemble you know you because that's your core competency that can be an exam scenario which comes up part of engine assembly is outsourced hr function is outsourced do you think this is a good decision you'll have to know what outsourcing is right outsourcing is in your e1 syllabus so outsourcing means contracting out aspects of work which you were previously doing in house to someone else who is an expert and this can help you but it can also have limitations now remember this word you should always outsource something only which is not your core competency now for example if engine assembly is your core competency you are excellent at that and you outsource it what's the point of your business then this is for example i'm saying if they tell you that sales uh, hr function is being outsourced now hr is not your core competency your job is to make tractors and sell them best tractors and sell them so hr can be outsourced but if engine assembly uh, chassis assembly you know any of that happens then your business can suffer so your core activities can never be outsourced your non core activities you can choose to outsource them both have advantages and disadvantages which have been stated for you over here the disadvantages are very straightforward cost issues it's not going to be cheap just because you outsourced it second you will have to always maintain that relationship you will have to always keep negotiating you are always uh, too much dependent on them because if anything slows down the entire business will slow down the organization culture can get affected and most importantly you can lose your core competence you can lose your major uh, culture advantages are also present you know it can help you save costs as well it has quality advantages because the outsourcer is an expert other advantages like uh, you know flexibility because you can switch your supplier suppliers may have greater efficiency so your cost might be saved now these points you can remember in your own words and any outsourcing related question or topic that comes up you can straight apply it you can straight make sense of it so this is something which you can keep in mind of in terms of your second topic first topic was your organizational structure second topic was your outsourcing topic third topic is importance of information for decision makers now throughout the pre scene they have mentioned multiple times about uh, you know information big data multiple times they have mentioned all of this but not gone into the details not gone into actually how the decisions are being made or is uh, technology is data really being used in the decision making process that has not been gone about in a whole lot of detail so that's my job to cover it for you then so firstly benefits of data in operations are very very clear in your operations which means in 
for operations for my business are producing the tractor so while producing the tractor benefits of data are huge because if i have the right data i can save costs i can better my process i can forecast in a better way and eventually i can produce in a better way because of all of this that i have taken care of so keep tracks your up at the center of your mind and think how data will help us in operations if i have extra data of where time can be saved of where cost can be saved then eventually my tractor will be produced as a lower cost i will be able to earn a higher margin which can be good for my business right second the uses of technologically derived data in marketing and sales is also huge so marketing and sales is one area where really data should be used by our company as well because if you use data you can price better if you have a huge comparison of the prices in the market the prices that you can charge which customers are willing to pay you can you know sell more if you segment the market well which means if you break down the market well understand where to market your product how to market your product and give the customers the product that they want then automatically your sales go up you can manage your relationship with the customer better with the help of feedback forms you know with the help of uh, loyalty programs all of this is being done in terms of us in terms of our company sorry trax europe you are not selling directly to the customer you are selling to dealerships so your relation with dealerships your uh, you know uh, knowledge sharing with dealerships can be very very important building new dealership networks very important all of this can happen if you combine technology and benefits of using digital information for decision makers is already evident because if information is provided the decision makers which in our case could be the sales and distribution head can really benefit by showcasing you know gains by coming up with products which dealerships are asking for which eventually customers want you know good performance of the company good segmentation of the market so we can attack the customers in the better way so our sales and distribution head can make huge information use if they have it but for that the entire company has to understand the benefits of data the benefits of technologically derived data and that is why it's important and that is why i have put it over here for you next topic very important is our value analysis or the value chain however you want to put it this is straight in your e1 syllabus as well now for value analysis we first need to understand our primary activities support activities as simple as that primary activities are inbound logistics which means receiving your raw material which for us is steel and the other components that we buy in operations is when the actual operation takes place and the tractor is made outbound logistics is we store the tractors until it goes to the dealerships marketing and sales straightforward is marketing and sales where you market and sell to the dealerships where you market to the dealerships they further sell it to the customer and after sales services is something which is not in our control because we don't have our own dealerships because we don't do the service uh, aspect as well let's put it that way but still this is how the primary activities are broken down these are very important these are very uh, vital after sales could be when you sell it to the dealership dealership sells it to the customer customer comes back with a query where there is a fault and dealership contacts you you know you have to rectify it then so that also is part of after sales services these are my primary activities the support activities are supporting these primary activities naturally 
So it's with, to do with the firm structure, where we know it's a functional structure, but the sales has a divisional structure. Then there is human resource management, HR, we have an HR director. Technology, how the firm uses technology, this really needs to be looked on because our company is using automated machinery for its in its production. But we are not really using data, we are not enhancing the use of data, we are not using big data, data analytics, none of that is mentioned. So think about what can be our primary activities, what can be our support activities. To give you an example, I have chosen the operation as tractor manufacturing. What is the input? The parts, the components, sub-assemblies, the tractor cabs, which come from the subsidiary in the other, in our, in our group itself. High grade steel, paint, cleaning solution, we buy all of this and this is an input. The process is engine assembly, chassis assembly, body panel assembly, main assembly, and testing. What is the output? High quality tractors for agricultural purposes. So you know that your inputs have to be good, your process has to be well managed so that the output is good. So remember, primary activities are very important. Note what your primary activities are. Note what your support activities and and see how you can better your primary activities, how you can better your support activities. That's how a business grows. This was value analysis. Next, relation with suppliers. Now in our business as well, and we have learned in our pre-seen, Trax Europe has good relation with suppliers because if you have good relation with suppliers, only then if the input is good, the output will be good. If the quality and the relation and the timely delivery from suppliers is good, your final product, which is the tractor, will be good. It's always better to have a collaborative relationship with suppliers where you build relations to maintain quality for a long period of time. We can also partner with suppliers to share knowledge and ensure that a long-term sustainable relationship is built. I spoke about suppliers first because it links into the TQM system and it links into the JIT system which I'm going to speak about. Now total quality management is something which has been mentioned in the pre-scene and which is something which has been uh, and which is something which one of the board of directors of our company is promoting. So naturally it is something that is important and something that is going to be uh, you know used by our company if you see the production director jack newman you will see that he is promoting the initiatives of total quality management so what is total quality management because a scenario question around it is easily possible my suggestion is remember this diagram what are the fundamentals of tqm Prevention of errors before they occur. So there should, the, the errors should be prevented even before they occur. For this, it will have to be good quality input. Second, continual improvement. You find a problem, improve. You find a problem, improve. Continuously you want to improve. Third, real participation by all. Participation by the entire organization coming together. And commitment of senior management, which means the board of directors should also be committed to the TQM fundamentals. So what are the fundamentals? Pre uh, uh, prevention of errors before they occur, continuous improvement and participation by all, all of which is only possible if senior management is committed. So remember this diagram and then you can explain it in your own sweet simple words. So the implementation of TQM is by first having a good senior management consultancy meeting and commitment meeting. Second, you can have a quality steering company, which means a committee that looks at quality in the entire manufacturing process. Third, presentations and training. The steering committee should communicate the benefits to the employees 
to the directors, to the management, production management, different departments that we have, the benefits of quality. This will help us establish quality circles. And eventually, you need to monitor the progress where if there is an error, you improve. If there is an error, you improve. So TQM is a fundamental, uh, I'll say, system which is important and quality has to run throughout the organization. Now we have a very adjoining and related topic here, which is JIT, which I have spoken about in the pre-scene as well. Now JIT, you, you, rather you'll see in our pre-scene that everywhere we are receiving the raw material, storing it. We are then forwarding it to the next department, they are storing it. Final finished goods, then we are storing it. So JIT is where inventory is considered as a waste. Because, you know, it's lying there, you're not selling it, you're not getting money out of it, your money is parked in one place, your money is stored in one place. So JIT is an area where, uh, you know, JIT is a system which can help us improve on the same. JIT means you produce only when it's required by the next department and only when it's required by the final customer. Customer places the order, then it goes into production and quickly your production process is streamlined so that the uh, good is delivered to the customer. The good is delivered to uh, or the tractor is delivered to the customer. So JIT purchasing is when you order materials only when the customer places an order. When the goods are received to you, they straight away go into production. You can keep a scene realistically achieving 100% JIT might not be possible, but you can keep a very low level of inventory. And as soon as the customer places an order, it goes into production and new order is sanctioned and eventually, you know, that system, that circle keeps moving on and on and on. So when the goods are received, straight into production. Production is also a pull system where there is no storage of inventory or anything of that sort. So the production is as and when needed and when the order is placed. When, for example, from our first production department, let me just pull it up for you. From our first production department, engine assembly only starts when the chassis assembly manager is free. Not that the engine is made and then it's stored and one fine day the chassis assembly manager takes that engine and builds the chassis around it. One department only produces when the department ahead of it asks for it and finally when the customer asks for this this system starts so there is no inventory there is no storage there has to be a quick circle that keeps going on that's called just in time receive go into production produced goes to the dealership directly so for this to happen it is very natural that you require quality because there is no time to keep checking, checking, checking again and again. You need a very good relation with your suppliers. You need a speed of production. And without good relation with suppliers, none of this is possible. So GIT is realistically possible, but it needs this background that I have spoken about. Next topic is key performance indicators. And again, something that we spoke about in the pre-scene. Now, key performance indicators are the second step for any organization. The first thing that the organization has to figure out is critical success factors. So critical success factors are vital areas where things must go right for the business in order for them to achieve their strategic objectives. So you must do this right. For example, you must have high quality tractors or you must have good relation with suppliers or you must have good relation with dealerships. This can be your critical success factors. These critical success factors are then broken down into smaller 
KPIs into smaller performance indicators. For example, let's say the critical success factor is good relation with dealerships. Then the KPI can be uh, number of contacts made with the dealership or number of complaints raised by the dealership or number of meetings held with the dealership. You're seeing how the KPI is very, very, very specific, number oriented, percentage oriented. It's very specific to that CSF. So remember when they ask you to suggest KPIs, you have to be specific. They can be percentage, you know, percentage defect rate, percentage wastage rate, labor rate, warehouse rate, transport rate, time taken to deliver, time taken to deal with complaints, time taken to speak with, uh, you know, the dealerships, etc, etc. So they're very, very specific. They're very, very related. They're very, very centered. That is what KPIs are. Now we are speaking about types of pricing. See, many a times in the exam, they come up with a question in our pre-scene. They'll tell us what is the costing system of our business. But many a times in the exam, they come up with a question as to what if we change our pricing? What if we change our pricing method from premium pricing to let's say penetration pricing? What if we change it to, and what are the different pricing strategies available? They do often ask us that, right? They do often ask the types of pricing in the exam. So it's important for us to know what our current pricing system is because we are quality oriented, because our business has been in the market for a long time. Premium pricing or high pricing suits our business model. But they can ask that a new product is being introduced. What should be the pricing strategy? So you should, you should know what the different pricing strategies are in the market. And they have been listed down over here for you. So cost plus pricing, penetration pricing, discrimination, going rate pricing. You can just go through them, remember them in your own words. And if a question comes up, replicate it. If a question comes up, you know, these ideas will be ready with you. Same way, they can ask you how, what are the new different types of marketing techniques. So you can have experiential marketing, digital marketing, guerrilla marketing, viral marketing. These are questions which often come up, which are straight related to your E1 syllabus. That is important to know. And I'm, I'm bringing all the important pointers in one place for you to make it simple, easy for you. And this is E1 applied to the case study in a short way, but still giving you a whole lot of insights, whole lot of ideas and areas to focus on.